All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I want you to welcome Peter Suter. He is a TAM from HashiCorp. TAM, TAM, sounds like a drum, but it's not a drum. It's a real job. And uh, he is actually an amateur power lifter. And I think he's going to lift your spirits with his great talk. So please, a round of applause for Peter. Uh, so, hello everyone, uh, my name is Peter Suda, and uh, yeah, this is my talk, uh, Head in the Clouds, um, uh, Testing Infrastructure as Code. So before we get, uh, begin, I want to introduce myself, uh, my name is Peter Suda, um, I'm a Technical Account Manager at HashiCorp, so basically I do kind of all the kind of post-sales engagement stuff on the technical side, so we have enterprise versions of um, all of our products and then people buy them, which is awesome because it means that I get to feed my family. Uh, and then from there, we um, uh, kind of engage on the technical side and kind of follow up stuff from this. Um, this is my, I think it's my, whatever I done there. Uh, this, uh, yeah, I've been coming to Config Management Camp since 2014. Um, and yeah, it's been an awesome conference and I really like it. And uh, yeah, uh, I've kind of worn a lot of hats in my time. I've done pro services, I've been a dev, I've been testing, I've kind of gone through all different things. So. So, pretty important, what are we here to talk about? Uh, so this is Config Management Camp 2020. So infrastructure as code is a pretty big deal. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know, hopefully uh, most people know, have heard of this term before, but the idea is you're basically treating um, your infrastructure in the same way you'd be treating your code. Um, and why do you want to do that? Um, so there's a bunch of benefits. Uh, you can generate things from scratch. Uh, you can get code review and collaboration. You can kind of conceptualize everything because you have it in a code form rather than uh, in a GUI or in someone's head. Uh, you get auditing and policies. You can kind of iterate over time, start with something small and build stuff, on, uh, build stuff later on. <clears throat> you can modularize, reuse, hide complexity. And, and the bit we're going to talk about mostly here is uh, testing. So why do we want to test in the first place? Well, ultimately, as we go through the list, basically everything there becomes easier with testing because testing is mostly about being confident in your kind of code and deploys. If you want to regenerate from scratch, you want to be pretty. You want to be in a pretty uh, secure idea that your code is doing exactly what you want to do. If you want to review and collaborate, if someone's opening a pull request, you don't want to have to just eye it. You want to test to tell you that the code they've written isn't breaking things. Um, it's a lot easier to conceptualize when things are tested. So essentially, everything kind of comes from testing, really. There. Um, I've got a pretty good quote here from Devin Kim. He was in the HashiCorp Slack when I was talking about this kind of topic last year. Um, and he was basically saying that in, in his eyes, infrastructure is code without testing is self-sabotage, which is pretty strong words, but I pretty much agree with him there. So we're here at Config Management Camp. Um, we're, you know, we've been doing this for a while, but let's have a little quick history lesson of kind of config management and testing, really. And before we start, I'll give my caveats. Um, I uh, obviously currently work for HashiCorp. In the past, uh, I've worked for Puppet. Uh, before then, I kind of did devops -y government stuff in the UK. So I'm going to have biases. Obviously, I'm going to generally favor my company and my products and stuff. But a lot of the ideas that we're going to talk about um, can be, and I'll give some examples for other tools as well. <clears throat> but a lot of the ideas we'll be talking about are kind of general ideas for all the infrastructure as code or anything that interacts with the cloud, really. But you'll see that there's probably a little bit of bias towards Puppet and um, Terraform here. And I should probably emphasize that I'm not on the engineering team. Uh, there, there are some people from the uh, HashiCorp engineering team that are here currently and the DevRel team. But anything I say, like it's not a commitment that we're going to do that uh, or any kind of questions I answer, I can't give you a definitive answer on things like roadmap and stuff. But um, the idea is that I have talked to those people and I work with those people a lot. So uh, it gives you a general idea of what's going on there. Uh, and one funny thing uh, is that Terraform technically isn't the config management tool. Uh, we see it as an infra management tool. Um, the idea is that it's about focusing on the strengths there. Like we don't try and uh, do the same thing as other things like that. So technically doing something like this. <laughs> so a little history lesson. Uh, people have probably heard of this analogy before, um, but in the old days, uh, everyone kind of treated their um, infrastructure as uh, pets, not uh, livestock. If something went wrong, you kind of had to log in and nurse it back to health. You worried about it. Um, every time you did a deploy, you were kind of worried. If you had to bring it up from scratch, it's always going to be a big stressor. So we want to move to this new world of if something goes wrong with a machine, you can just blow it away and bring it back up. And you're relatively sure that all the code that you've kind of done to set it up is going to set it up in the exact same way. So a bunch of tools uh, were uh, either created or invented or kind of developed around that idea. 
and you'd start deploying them to a pre-prod environment, so something like a staging or something like that, and that's kind of like the first way of doing the testing there. And the people started saying, I don't want to have to have all these different environments for everything going on, so why don't we have some sort of lab or some sort of way of creating these as VMs instead? And then containers, which obviously had been around for a long while, like over 20 years, if you count things like jails and things like that, um, kind of became more mainstream with things like Docker, which was simplifying the user experience. So then you started to do testing against containers, which is a lot faster than testing against the VM. And then the cloud came along. Obviously, this is not fully accurate time zone-wise because the cloud has been around for a long time. But in terms of what people are interested in, people started to say, like, OK, we're not doing stuff on bare metal or VMs anymore. We're doing things in a cloud. So then all these existing tools started doing more kind of tighter cloud integrations. And then a bunch of tools that were specifically designed for the cloud started to come out, and they started working that way as well. So then people started asking, like, how do we test these things? Because uh, if you're testing um, a conflict management language and you're running it against um, you know, a system that you control, like a VM or a doc container, it's pretty easy to create it and destroy it afterwards. But how do you test something against uh, a system that you don't really have direct control over, like a cloud? And how do you make sure that the um, infrastructure as code that's working against these clouds is actually doing what you expect it to do and is doing it in following policies and following governance and things like that? And how do you do it without spending too much money on the whole thing? So people started to ask, how do we test the cloud? And there's two kind of um, people interested in this kind of term. There's producers and consumers. So uh, from a HashiCorp perspective, we're a bit of both. Um, we produce these tools that talk to cloud APIs. We also consume our own code because we use our cloud APIs. Uh, we use our own tools to build our own products. And we also write things like modules for customers. So we're kind of both. I imagine that most people here are probably on the consumer side, unless you work for a company that produces a cloud tool. Um, but generally, I'm going to try and emphasize the kind of differences in each approach and where it really benefits either a producer, a consumer, or both. So who here would describe themselves as a tester? No one. Oh, a few hands on there. Okay. Uh, who here has some ideas around testing or some of the theory behind testing? Okay, more hands there. So people at least know the ideas. But I'll give a brief introduction on the ideas of testing and where the kind of background came from. So you've probably seen something like this before, a test pyramid. This is from uh, Martin Fowler's blog. But the idea is that the lower down on the stack, you want more cheaper, faster to run unit tests that don't require integration. And as you go up the stack, they get more expensive, but they have tighter integration you have with um, your actual applications themselves. Obviously, this is talking about service tests and UI tests. In a config management world, we're probably doing something like this. So unit testing at the bottom, acceptance testing in the middle, and then kind of full stack integration testing at the top. What often happens is something like this. Uh, this is called the uh, software testing ice cream cone uh, anti-pattern. Generally, things like acceptance and integration tests and manual regressions are seen as more visible, and uh, especially with something like manual user regression testing, a lot easier to do in theory because you just throw bodies at the problem. Um, so this kind of became an anti-pattern where you wouldn't write many unit tests, but you just have an army of people just hitting your stuff and making sure it did stuff there. Um, and this will be reflected in, you know, someone does a Terraform run, and then someone kind of looks at it, eyeballs it, and goes, yeah, that'll probably be okay, and just merges it, bad stuff. So we want to eat the cone from the bottom. Um, if anyone, uh, who here knows about Cornettos? I don't know if they're called different things about in Europe. I've got a few hands there. So the bottom of the Cornetto, because it has a chocolate edge around the uh, cone, it all kind of falls into the bottom and has this really <coughs> awesome little chocolate core. Um, so we want to try and get that. We want to eat the chocolate uh, Cornetto cone from the bottom and get those unit tests out there. So let's start with the most simple tests. And these are not really tests. These are almost like smoke, the most basic thing you need to do to get your um, infra management kind of code working. So uh, depending on how your infra code is written, it's either a kind of framework that works with an existing uh, code, you know, that's like, templated in something like YAML. It's either its own language, something like HCL or TF uh, or Puppet, or it's written in another language, and then you can syntax, syntax check it that way, something like Chef, which is written in Ruby. So for Ruby, you're just going to run a compilation check against, uh, so for Chef, you're going to run a compilation check against Ruby. For Terraform, we have to validate command. Um, for anyone, who's on, uh, who's using Terraform currently? Bunch of hands. Who's using Terraform 0.12 currently? Most of the same hands, cool. So in the 0.12 release we just had, um, we added a bunch of really new, cool new features. One of my favorite is the fact that the debug messages you get and the error messages you get are a lot more, um, uh, they're a lot richer and they give you much more information and they can even tell you like line numbers and precisely where something is going wrong. So it's definitely something that I want you to check out if you're not, or not on 0.12 currently. 
Um, Ansible has the dash dash check command for playbook running, but obviously you can just run a YAML linter against a YAML file itself to make sure that the, uh, the YAML you're giving it makes sense. And Puppet has the Puppet parser. So the next step after that is kind of basically a compilation check, but for rules that don't break the language itself. So that's linting. So depending on the language, there's generally some sort of linter that's been officially blessed um, by the company, or at least is being used by a lot of the community. And then you probably want to run something like that. You can even, a lot of these uh, linters have their own custom rules that you can write. So there's something that you're doing internally at your company that isn't like a kind of globally accepted idea, like we don't want to do this certain thing. You can generally write a linter for that. So for tflint, um, there's a tool that's been written uh, called tflint, um, and basically this will go through and lint things. I th right now it's very tied to the provider, so right now it's very focused on AWS, but uh, he's working, the um, original creator of it is working on a plugin system, so hopefully in the future that can be more plugged in and do things like that. Chef has food critic, uh, Puppet has Puppet lint, and Ansible has Ansible lint, and basically these all work in the same way. They highlight not errors, but things you probably shouldn't be doing. So I kind of sped for a lot of that because a lot of this stuff has been covered. Um, I mean, a lot of that isn't really testing. It's like the most basic level of stuff you want to gate in top part of your pipeline. Um, but unit testing is when we really start getting into actual testing. So what do we talk about with unit testing? The idea is that you're building things to make sure you're building it right. So acceptance testing is making sure the thing kind of runs. Unit tests are making sure that the code you're writing actually is well done. Um, and a really good tweet about basically the ideas around uh, what is, and is not a unit test. Um, this is pretty strict. Like, I think half the unit tests I've seen probably don't follow this. But the idea is a unit test should be able to run um, you know, in multi-threaded, uh, on a read-only environment system. Um, it doesn't need a file system, it doesn't need a database, it doesn't even need technically a lot of the time real internet connection. But the idea is it's something that you can run on any sort of system. You want to be able to run it in your CI and it will pass in the same way you'd run it on a laptop. And then you have the red-green refactor loop. So you write a failing test, you then refactor your code so it passes the test, and then it's green. You then go through that code and then see if you can refactor it again, run the test again, it's green. So that's a quick run-through of testing theory and where it kind of comes from. Um, and the unit test you write, especially when it comes to config management, it's very easy to write basically tautological unit tests. You don't want to write a test that just goes like, if you're writing some puppet code that says um, install Apache, there's no point writing a test that just goes, should contain package Apache. That's just a tautological test. You can see that just by looking at the code. You really want to test the edge cases. So if you're taking in variables in something like Terraform, if you're running differently depending on which platform you're on, like if you're on Debian, you want to use apt. If you're on Red Hat, you want to use yum. That's the kind of thing that you should be testing in your unit tests. And producers and consumers really have different intents for unit tests. If you're a producer, you're probably testing your code in the language it's probably written. Um, if you're a consumer, you're probably testing a pre-written module and kind of doing it on the, the language side. So for Puppet, there's RSpec Puppet. If you're familiar with the kind of Ruby ecosystem, um, RSpec is basically like a BDD style language. So it's all kind of behavioral style, uh, should, if, when kind of thing. Um, in this example, I'm using my fish repo, the fish shell. Um, and I'm saying, if I'm on, and I'm testing, I'm not doing a tautological test. I'm saying, if I'm on CentOS, then expect this yum repo to be enabled if the parameter managed repo is true. And this is basically testing the edge cases there. And you have the same for Chef. There's something called um, uh, Chef Spec. And again, it's built on R spec. You're doing the same thing. You're mocking out the Chef run with the platform it's on. And then it's doing changes based on that run. <coughs> for Terraform, right now, there's nothing really official. Um, there is an uh, issue on the GitHub with some discussion around how we would do that, um, maybe building it in something like that. But honestly, we have a pretty big backlog. Like, I think in the time, I've taken the screenshot maybe three times over the last few weeks. I think the lowest it ever dipped in the kind of recent history, I think when 012 came out, we closed a lot of long running 012 specific issues and it got down to around 900, but they quickly filled up with all the issues that people have with 012. So <laughs> it's not something that we're like actively looking to do right now, but it's always something that we'd be interested in in the future. So there's a few contenders for this. Um, a lot of them are kind of built meta, like on top of the uh, reading the kind of language itself. So the first is Clarity. Um, this is all kind of Gherkin style, it's all BDD, so it's all feature files that say like, you know, if AWS instance is this, so you don't actually have to write anything in Go or in Terraform itself, you're writing this purely in a feature file format. 
and this will pass the HCL itself. So it can't do anything that's state-based. And we talked a lot about state this morning, uh, and I'll talk a bit about state later on. But this is entirely on the code, not on the state that it will produce. So in this basic example, uh, given a Terraform, inst uh, given Terraform and AWS instance of resource, um, I want to have an instance type of T1 micro, and there's only one of it. So this is a really basic test. I've got some Terraform code that's just one um, T micro instance, and it should be there. There's also Terraform compliance. It's very similar in how it works. Um, it's more from a kind of policy compliance kind of setting, but this one will actually use the plan output, so it's real state, or at least state that's been simulated as part of a plan. So this one would require you're on a system that actually can run the Terraform, so it'll need the plugins there, and depending on how the plan is written, it might need to actually talk to the public internet. It depends on the provider and how it works. Um, uh, and, but yeah, it basically is the same sort of idea. It's Gherkin style uh, formatting, and then it has Terraform specific matches. In this, I'm doing more of a kind of policy style check. I'm making sure that all of my resources are tagged. So it's going through anything that supports tags. It's making sure that there is a tag there for name. I've got a really basic tagging system here. And lastly, the, uh, the kind of non-BDD style is Terraform Validate. So this is written in Python. It uses the PyTest uh, native unit testing that's uh, part of Python itself. Um, this also uh, this uses HCL rather than plans, um, but the idea is that if you don't really like BDD style tests and you want to keep it more unit style, then you'd write it in this. You need, obviously need to know Python to do this. So in this example, I've got a similar sort of test where I'm basically saying, um, does my uh, AWS instance have tags? So this can go through, and it's, you can see it's failing on should have properties tags, and it's saying that the date tag should be there, and it wasn't, so it failed the test. So that's unit testing, it's pretty fast, uh, easy to write, no environment really needed, um, but you're not really testing the actual outcome. So far we're not actually interacting with the cloud at all. Um, so this is the kind of first level of testing you can do, but it's still the kind of cheapest and easiest bit. So we're gonna move on to the hard part, integration and acceptance. So people use the terms interchangeably, um, and honestly, depending on who you talk to, I've heard different answers about it, but the best summary I've heard is that acceptance is the kind of uh, consumer or well, customer facing style tests of like how the full system kind of works interact with each other. Integration is more on the kind of a unit test for a single piece but then talks to real systems. But ultimately the stuff we're talking about is the same. Um, and it's a pretty good diagram of how people generally see this. But if we're going to write these tests and these integration acceptance tests against the cloud, how do we control something that, I mean, how do we test against something that we can't control? So there's three approaches that I've seen. So the first one, it kind of stays with um, testing in general, um, use fixtures. So basically start mocking things out. So fixtures are basically a fixed baseline that you put inside your code repo, and then it will be able to run without having to actually talk to the real thing. So fixtures can be physical files on disk, but generally it's some sort of recording of like JSON requests and stuff like that. Depending on the tool you're using, there's generally some sort of automatic recording framework. Uh, in Ruby, there's a tool called WebMock and VCR. You can basically run with both of those on. It will download all the HTTP requests it's making and store the responses locally in your system. You can go through and kind of like remove any kind of sensitive information and you have a pre-done VCRs that are then replayed every time you do the test. So ultimately, these kind of tests are pretty similar to unit tests. If we go back to our requirements for a unit test, you know, we're mocking out those responses. So ultimately, they could run in the same way that um, a unit test does because they're not actually interacting with real things. So for a real life example of this, um, we have the Acme provider. If you don't know, Acme is the protocol that tools like Let's Encrypt use to have a kind of um, call and response style uh, CA that gets certificates. Um, we don't want to have to run our own Acme server, and we don't want to run it against the real Let's Encrypt server, because we'd probably get shadow banned when running acceptance tests. Um, so instead, we're going to use fixtures. Um, and then Golang itself has a built-in kind of fixture, kind of mocking fi uh, tool called HTTP test. And it basically looks something like this. So this is a screenshot of the real code from the Acme provider. We've got a custom JSON response, what we want the um, mocked uh, Acme provider to look like. We then have some definitions of a HTTP test server. And then later on in the code, we just refer to that test. So then every time it's doing it, instead of trying to talk to the real internet, it's talking to this mocked service that's running locally, basically. So fixture mocking is pretty good. No dependency on cloud, very quick to run because essentially they're pretty much unit tests. Um, but it's gonna be a lot of work to maintain fixtures. And ultimately, the bit we care about is this isn't really testing the cloud, because right now we're still not talking to the cloud. We're taking what we think is the current state of it, and we talk about state a lot, and then 
taking a snapshot of that, keeping it locally within the repo, and then testing it into that. You're not really testing it yet. So to go beyond even that, you have simulated clouds. So uh, if people are familiar with like microservices and Lambda um, and functions and things like that, generally you're um, writing code that's going to run um, in a kind of on-demand uh, Lambda or serverless or whatever we call it these days. Um, and the idea is that devs were writing this code and then they're like, I don't have to deploy to a real API every time I do this. I want some sort of simulated way of doing that. So the three big clouds, uh, Azure, um, AWS, and GCP, have these emulators and simulators. Um, and they, so you can just download them and run them. Um, and then they will simulate those APIs, and they give real responses. And some of the more complicated ones will even act like the real thing, but obviously just not backed by a bunch of core cool HA and stuff behind the scenes. So you can actually do something like an S3 upload and then call that API and actually get responses back and download data from it. So you can do quite deep testing with this. The most complex one I've seen is probably local stack. Um, it's basically like a cloud in a box. They cover all of the AWS APIs, at least in the paid version. In the free version, or the open source kind of free version, I think it's about 80% coverage. It hits most of the stuff that you'd really care about, S3, RDS, uh, EC2, and things like that. Um, but you basically run it in Docker, and then the idea is that if you have something that has a hard requirement on AWS, including infrastructure as code, you can run it against that, and it'll work from there. I think I saw people taking a photo of that, so I'm just gonna leave it up for a second. And now we have our first live devil warming, so let's see how this goes. Let's put this up here. Can everyone see that at the back? Cool, thumbs up from there, cool. All right, so first, we can look at the readme file. Um, and essentially, yeah, it, you run it as a Docker container, and then after that, you export dummy e uh, access uh, key IDs and secret IDs, and then after that, it pretty much works in the same way. So let's run the commands. I'm going to try and look up there. So let's just copy and paste this bit. Oh, crap. <laughs> That's what you get for trying to have a fancy uh, preview there. And then we can actually uh, open it up. <coughs> so on the right, it basically has uh, a GUI of the services that we've done so far. So I can do a Terraform init. And then do a Terraform apply. It's a good start so far. <laughs> I think basically because it uh, checks for the latest version of the provider to make sure that you're on the latest version. And I think the internet's just going a bit slow right now. So let me see. Oh, there we go. Uh, okay, cool.
So essentially, uh, we're running the same Terraform code, but as we said, uh, we're mocking the region. We're skipping a bunch of stuff because it's gonna, otherwise it's gonna actually try and talk to the real API. And then we're saying the S3 endpoint instead of trying to talk to S3, you know, the real life one, we're talking to the, the local one. So let's see if that's actually run. I'm going to leave that cookie in the background because it looks like the internet's going pretty slow, but every so often it kind of speeds up, so hopefully we can get that working in a bit. But the idea is that you could run your Terraform against this simulated uh, instance and it would work in the same way. I didn't warn you, live demo, so. <laughs> so the pros of the kind of fixture mocking, uh, you don't have any dependency on the cloud, um, you have more debugging than you would for a fixture, but ultimately it's just a fancy, it's a fixture on steroids at this point. Um, the cons are, it's not going to exist for every service, um, even the ones that are officially maintained by um, AWS and Azure and uh, you know, Microsoft and Google and, AWS and Amazon, um, they generally take two particular services, generally something like storage and Lambda and kind of test it from there. Um, you basically have to rely on the simulated service keeping in line, and again, we're still not really testing anything, because right now we're testing against a mock, a fancy mock, but still a mock. So lastly, the option is, don't actually mock anything, do it for real. And unsurprisingly, as a producer of um, infrastructure as code tools, this is how we do it. So Terraform has a model where you have Terraform Core, you have a bunch of provider plugins that talk to upstream APIs, and then we need to basically um, have tests that are kind of extensive and deep enough that every single one of our providers ends up testing every single resource that's in there. That's actually one of the things that we, um, as an engineering team, we don't generally accept things that we can't easily test. Um, for example, the Azure API now has a way of creating users within the Azure API, but there's a hard limit of 200, and you have to go and talk to, um, I think it's help desk or something like that to get it extended. So it's not something we're going to actively work on until it's not like that anymore, because testing it would just be too much of a pain. If you run that test like maybe twice or three times, you're going to be locked out immediately. So we want to make sure that testing works from there. And our kind of model is there are providers that we maintain officially. Um, there are, and then of those, they are generally um, helped maintain by partners or the community. And we want to make sure that all of those are tested in the same ways. Obviously, we generally do much more testing for the stuff that we work with the partners directly on or we work uh, on ourselves at HashiCorp. Um, a lot of the time when a new feature comes out, we try and make sure that it's ready um, as part of the initial release of that feature. And we want to make sure that the testing covers that as well. So Terraform itself has like a bunch of providers. We talk to everything. We even talk to our own products. We have providers for console and Nomad and Vault. So we want to make sure that these tests are pretty extensive and make sure they cover in the same ways. So for the Azure provider is a good example. We have a test suite that runs nightly that basically runs literally every single resource that's in the provider. Um, and this runs within our internal infrastructure. Um, so the full suite. Um, we've got it running. You can see that there's about 118 uh, failing and there's 17, 29 passing. So there's a lot of resources within the Azure provider. We're testing literally every single one of these. Um, and you can probably see that this takes a pretty long time. For the full Azure suite, it's about 10 hours. Um, and then obviously, depending on what you're trying to do, this can be shorter or longer, but if you're trying to test every single one, some resources, especially things like AKS, are a lot slower. They can be like 15, 20 minutes to spin up. So you know, the more tests you're writing, the longer this is going to take. And generally, depending on how you do this, this is probably going to cost you a little bit of money, either literally in terms of like cloud resources, or if you're running a service that you maintain yourself, probably in terms of like developer time and figuring out from there. But ultimately, as HashiCorp, we have to do that, because from a producer point of view, we're testing the tool and everything it does. Um, Mitchell actually spoke, a uh, co-founder of HashiCorp, um, actually spoke at, I think it was Config Management Camp 2015, uh, about Terraform, and then when the initial kind of acceptance test suites started being made, we actually found a few bugs in cloud APIs because we were hitting them with like really high concurrency and a lot of the tools around at the time didn't really do that. So we actually managed to fix real life bugs with those cloud providers, which is pretty cool. But as a consumer, you probably don't need something this extensive. You probably want to test it um, uh, more of an integration style. You want to test it based on your organization and your deployment and your infrastructure. You don't need to test the individual pieces, you test the final outcome that you get from it. And ultimately you care about the state. 
So that's where something like TerraTest comes in. Um, it's basically a full acceptance testing framework for uh, Terraform. It was written by Gruntworks, who uh, maintain a lot of modules to do this. So should, they wrote a Golang testing framework. It's written in Golang. Um, it has a bunch of helpers for testing certain things. So it has helpers for testing the state itself. But then it has test uh, helpers for actually like logging onto the box and testing the actual uh, creations inside there. Um, the thing about uh, you know we talk about state a lot. Everything that happens after Terraform stops, so provisioning itself, that's not really part of Terraform state, as it were. That's something that's better handled by a config management tool. Um, but if you want to test that, you probably want to use something like TerraTest or maybe Test Kitchen to log on to the box or log into however it is and kind of test it that way. Um, and the folks from Gromworks have said basically the ROI on this is pretty big. Um, they've caught a lot of aggressions uh, and problems. They also mentioned it does take a while. but um, And yeah. Pretty basic test. You're literally running real Terraform when you do this um, and setting it up in certain ways. So the pros, you get pretty good end-to-end -end testing. You're interacting with real APIs and the closest to the real thing. Uh, the cons, obviously, it's a slower. It can be costly. And depending on how you've got it set up, you might interfere with real infrastructure when you're doing this. So there's two extra steps I want to go beyond conventional testing. So the first one is observability. And I'm not going to go too deeply on this. Um, there's a bunch of tools out there. Uh, I assume that most people are using at least one of these already. Um, but ultimately, as operators of this software, we want to test it beyond the test suite. We want to see if it's actually working as the end user uses it. And there's only so much you can do with testing. Um, it's a pretty good uh, diagram from Weaveworks. They basically talk about how after you deploy something and observe it and use that observation to feedback. Maybe it's not a full failure, but maybe something you've written is quite slow, and maybe you detected that as part of your um, you know, ELK stack and said, like, oh, I can see that there's a little bit more 50, uh, 500s, and we need to figure out from there. So that's observability. Um, there's a really good talk from Charity Majors, who uh, I think she f just founded um, uh, honeycomb.io. Um, she was actually here last year and did a talk on that, so I recommend going and watching that if you want to know more about observ uh, observability. And the last is governance. Um, there's been a I can see even from the talks I've had before there, there's been more talks around kind of governance and policy. Um, every organization is going to have some form of policy, either official or unofficial, you know, either dependent on real life legal requirements or not. So you have naming conventions, tagging, price, uh, price guides, cost centers and limits, legal requirements, regulations, things like GDPR, we can't deploy outside of Europe and things like that. And they all fall under the umbrella of governance. And mostly it looks like this. It's dead tree format. So you have all this written stuff down, either physically or in some wiki somewhere, and someone has to go through with a fine tooth comb and look at your code to make sure it's doing what it's expected to do. So if we can reflect policies as code, you get the same benefits you would as infrastructure as code. Um, and at HashiCorp, we have HashiCorp Sentinel. It's basically an embedded policies code uh, format. Um, in this example, we're going for a TF run, similar to the things we talked about before, and it makes sure that um, all of your resources are tagged so it just goes like if tags, then make sure they're greater than zero. Um, for a more security oriented thing, you're going to go through all of the security groups and make sure that um, they're not that you're not allowing public internet access for through the zero zero zero. And uh, yeah, I think I'm going to use my final ten minutes to try another live demo and see how that goes. <laughs> so let's see if that's running in the background. All right, that's the timing out. So we'll try this one instead. <coughs> So in this example, I've just written some basic Terraform code. Um, I'm finding the Ubuntu image. Uh, and right now, I've got it set to T3 large. If I, oh. check my master branch, I've got it set to T2 micro. So if I jump back to this window, Actually, I'm going to mirror these so I don't have to crane my neck. There we go. It's a lot easier. All right, I think the internet's not going to work for this one either. <laughs> So come and talk to me afterwards. I can do a demo of that. But the idea is that basically we have this uh, sentinel policy uh, called uh, block price increase. Um, so this will basically go through your code 
and it will uh, it will go through the Terraform that you've written, um, and it basically has an idea that it will look at the current cost based around the cost estimator, which is a part of Terraform Enterprise, and it will say if the cost that you've done increases 10%, then block the run from happening, and then you can set that to either hard failure, so nothing can be done about it, or soft failure, where someone on an admin level has to go through and approve it. So the idea is it's the kind of policy you probably already have, maybe even unofficially. Um, there's a general idea of try not to spend too much. But this is a pretty easy way of turning that into real code and running it that way. So, what have we learned? Um, we've learned the benefits of testing infrastructure as code. You know, if you don't do it, you're basically setting yourself up for failure. Um, we've talked about basic unit testing for infrastructure as code and the benefits you get from that. Um, we've talked about actually interacting with a real cloud and how you can either go anywhere from mocking it to emulating it to actually running it against the real thing and all the kind of benefits and disadvantages that come with that. Um, we talked about going a bit beyond conventional testing, so using something like observability to inform your next deploys, but you're not really testing it. You're doing it um, kind of more as a post-deploy step. Um, and also, we talked about the benefits of policy as code. Unfortunately, the demo didn't work, but come talk to me afterwards if you want to talk about that. So that's it. Thanks very much, everyone.